What is going on, everybody? Special crossover edition of Locked On. We have Carter Bird, Locked On's insider for Northwestern. I am Ryan Harris, your host of Locked On Badgers. Um, and we're going to get right into it. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Underdog. Uh, sign up for free at underdogfantasy.com with the promo code Locked On, and you can get a free first deposit double up to $100. You give them $100, they are going to give you $100 back. You can't beat that deal. And it's game week. There's been a lot going on, obviously, on the Wisconsin side, but we'd be remiss if we didn't dive into what has been a really seesaw battle over the last decade between two Big Ten West teams with Wisconsin and Northwestern. Carter, man, welcome to the show. Hey, man, our show, I, I am say. happy to be here. Thank you for uh, having me here today, and I love that we are getting to uh, talk about this this matchup on Saturday. So not the start either of our programs expected. <laughs> I think that's fair. You, you currently don't have a long-term head coach, and – my team's sitting here at one and four. It's not. It has not been the uh, dream start that we uh, all wanted. Listen, you might be bad, but you are not fire your head coach middle of the season bad yet. So you still have some bottom to fall out there. F- fair enough. But I think the uh, expectations were probably a little, a little bit different between both of our programs going into this season. I mean, you weren't coming off three and nine looking to build back and. Uh, so far, it just hasn't quite worked out for for Northwestern or or Pat Fitzgerald to this point. Well, let's start there with with your side. Uh, build back. You start off the game or start off the season with a neutral site victory over Nebraska, thirty one twenty eight. And then, what has been the big takeaway really in the last four games, where it feels like honestly the competition hasn't been outside of Penn State really that good, and it feels like feels like there's been inconsistency on both sides, but from your perspective, where has where Northwestern fallen short here? Well, kind of when you w- go back and watch their games, uh, especially that Duke game, the, the, the Southern Illinois game, they find ways to kind of dig holes, um, especially early against Duke, early against Nebraska even, uh, and that's been a big problem for this Northwestern team. Um, and, and, and I will say, Duke is having uh, what it appears to be a very much a bounce back year off of they were three and nine last year as well. And they, and they had a hot start. I know that they were, there was that fun stat that uh, after I think the first three or four weeks, you had Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, and uh, UNC all undefeated. They were talking about the basketball superpowers making their impact in football. But uh, basically they dig these holes and then they have to battle back, and they do have the fight to to put up that fight. Like they 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 have that they handle the adversity in terms of fighting back well. It just feels like any time a big moment pops up, it just does not go their way. It um, and I've I've said that on my show. I really thought after the Nebraska game that was going to be a springboard into a 4-0 start going into or a a, a yeah a, a, a 4 0 start going to Penn State and uh it just wasn't and it was um it was not exactly what I expected and uh it didn't quite go their way key turnovers losing the turnover battle there in the in the middle of the of of that run was was very difficult um having to put put yourself in positions where where you're having to throw so much to come back it's not exactly i feel like uh what what is this team's strength i will say at times Ryan Helinski's handled it very well but uh it's definitely it's been surprising to see this team that because i i firmly believe Pat Fitzgerald's one of the best coaches in the country and it's been been a little surprising to see them in that stretch run where they were losing a bunch of games in a row, well, they're still they still have done that, but uh, where they they kind of continued to make mistakes to dig holes. Teams started to figure out that on the second level, maybe there was a lack of speed and attacking the edge, mm-hmm. and took advantage of that and ripped off some some big plays. Um, yeah, it's just they've had some explosive plays and big spots go there go against them. In crucial moments, they've had some big turnovers. It just has not quite been um, the start you want. It hasn't been consistent enough, and that's why you're sitting here at one and four. Do you have 
is there a sense of optimism about some aspect of the program? Like, is there a place you've been able to point that says, you know, this is, we can turn the season around because of this unit or because of this player. I think it's encouraging. Granted, it was weather aided last week, the way the defense played, uh, forcing five turnovers at Penn state, um, kind of controlling the, I mean, they, they put up a lot better fight than we saw uh, Auburn at home when, 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 when Penn state had to go on the road, a lot better fight than we saw Auburn in that game and uh, kind of knocks uh, Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. I think all three running backs actually had fumbles in that game. And then of course, uh, Sean Clifford had some turnovers. I think that was encouraging to win the turnover battle to be in that game. Uh, I really thought that they were too conservative on offense early. It felt like the way the game opened, it was okay. This is going to be a seven, six muddy game, like super old school, big 10, like 1980s football. That's, that's what it felt like the mindset was. And I think that backs it up with the fact that the first eight plays on offense were basically runs right at the middle and Penn state was stacking the box. And so it just went nowhere in the, in the rain. Um, I will say, I think Ryan Holinsky's played his best ball of his college career. Uh, there are some flashes at South Carolina when, when he was a freshman, uh, he did beat Georgia in what was a really, really weird game uh, a few years back, but he has never really been, he's never been consistent really. It's either been, there's been a flashes in some games where it's been really good. And then it's been pretty up and down the rest of the time, but he opened the year extremely strong, um, played well the first couple of weeks. Weirdly enough, um, it was he got really rattled against a bad Southern Illinois secondary. Kind of salvaged it a little bit in the back half of that game, but he's been, regardless, he's been a lot better than we've we've probably seen for his career. And then outside of that, I said I think that that offensive line with the the anchors on the end mm -hmm. of Ethan Wiedeker with his approaching 30 starts in his career. And then obviously Peter Skaronsky, the one everybody talks about at left tackle, the first round draft pick. Um, the offensive line has been pretty consistent and pretty strong. And then you, you talk about the, the running backs. You talk about Evan Hall, who at one point was on a hilarious historic pace to start the year. He was on pace for 1600 receiving yards and a, about 1200 rushing yards. It would have been the first person. He's fallen off that pace pretty considerably uh, these past couple weeks. He's had a couple rougher games, but uh, he was he was on pace for the first FBS thousand yard receiving and rushing season ever, especially hmm. after his fourteen catch, two hundred thirteen receiving yard performance against Duke, which was like for a running back is just something you never see except you're and when you're playing Madden or NCAA mm -hmm. football on on the Xbox or the PlayStation. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Um, he's somebody that has struggled here recently. They need to get him back going to have any success the rest of the season. But I think, I think that he can, I mean, he's seen here he's, he's a captain. He's a leader in this, in this locker room. Um, he's in big spots this year. He's pretty much put the team on his back and said, all right, I'm going to carry us back into this game. I think a guy like that, you would expect him to bounce back after a couple rough, rough games. Uh, and he's he's a very talented back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to kind of wrap up here on this first part and just get your take on it. Do you think Northwestern sense is a bit of a, an opportunity here with maybe, I don't want to say a wounded animal, but kind of a wounded program coming in, homecoming for Northwestern? Yeah, I, I think that there is an aspect of that that um, probably exists um, just because of all of the the transition and the state of flux that that – that Wisconsin's in, it is an opportunity. It's back home. Um, it's homecoming. I don't want to say it's like last week was a moral victory going and competing for 60 minutes with Penn State, but, I mean, you were 25, 25 and a half point underdogs on the road, and you kind of went and handled yourself pretty well. Um, I mean, you you definitely scared Penn State more than, more than they – they thought you were, and um, so I think that there was there was a lot to build off of last week, especially on defense. And uh, but I do think that 
based on the comments that I've seen from from the uh, weekly press conferences, there are some some things that the the transition head coach with Jim Leonard taking over, they are concerned about. Uh, Fitz basically said there is an aspect of having to prepare like it's like it's an opener. Like you're gonna have there's gonna be some things that you haven't really seen on film probably, and you're gonna have to be willing to make those in-game mm-hmm. adjustments from drive to drive. And so I think that'll that's something that maybe has Northwestern a little bit on edge about the coaching transition. What what, what about you? What are the biggest what are the biggest storylines here for uh Wisconsin going into this one? Obviously, besides uh Jim Leonard. <laughs> right, besides the the um uh, fall of Paul Christ, you know, you know the the biggest storyline really I think is this is Wisconsin's opportunity to to fight back a little bit. Right. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, that's not to take a shot at Northwestern, but if they're not going to do it now, like you can get new coach energy, right? Like a new coach comes mm-hmm. in and players are ticked off. The, the, the player interviews this week were emotional. You know, if they go into Northwestern, they go into uh play in a place that traditionally really they've struggled a ton at Ryan field. If they go there mm-hmm. and they lay an egg, boy, they may not win another game this season. So Yeah. To me, that's the storyline is how do they how do they come out? Like what kind is this a program that is now just distracted and you know it isn't isn't ready to play, or is this a program that's ticked off? You know, uh, a couple players had interesting thoughts in terms of they didn't want to say it's our fault Paul Chris got fired, but they kind of said it's our fault. We didn't play well enough, and now we're playing for him. So hmm. does that always work out? No. Like, does the words always translate into action? No, but sometimes they do. So that's really tough. Wisconsin, the Wisconsin fan base, that's what we're looking for is how does this team come out? Are they fired up? Are they ticked off? Yeah, I know. I think that that's definitely interesting. Uh, somebody even asked Fitz about the like interim head coach, like just fired your head coach bounce. And he kind of was like, man, I, I certainly hope not. Let's, let's, let's hope that there's not just like a, all of a sudden this new injection of, of of energy it's absolutely can be um when you i mean it feels like when you go through that transition you have an opportunity to kind of prove something to 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 the fan base and when you look at wisconsin's schedule i mean you have to feel that for jim leonard i mean what it's Mm -hmm. a it's a true seven game audition here and uh he's got northwestern and when you look at the schedule this has to feel like a pretty great opportunity for him right because i mean Mm -hmm. this is a year where Besides maybe a couple teams in the conference, uh, but especially in the Big Ten West, it feels like anybody can kind of beat anybody this season. What are your What are your thoughts about the schedule and the way everything lines up for for Jim Leonard? Yeah, I think it's a perfect. I think you nailed it. It's a perfect opportunity to give him a little bit of leash and see what he does with it. Right um, mm-hmm. n- now, the, the primary issues for Wisconsin really over the last couple of years have been on the offensive side. So. You know, how do you evaluate a defensive guy coming in with a staff he didn't build? The offense probably isn't going to get fixed is my bigger point. But in-game decision-making, which Paul Chris has struggled at, quite frankly, um, a la James Franklin, you know, he's had some issues there. You know, does does Leonard clean that up? There's been a lot of penalty issues for the Badgers. That's a discipline mm-hmm. thing. It's attention to detail thing. That's something that can Leonard clean that up. You know, so I think if you see some of those smaller things clean up, quite frankly, to your point, uh, Wisconsin can beat a lot of teams on the schedule just because they are better. Um, mm. it's, it's kind of a backhanded compliment. It's not that Wisconsin's that good, but Iowa's offense for the most part this year has been terrible. You know, oh, Minnesota yeah. just lost last week. We've talked about yeah. Northwestern struggles. Wisconsin's as well. Any of those teams can also beat Wisconsin. But to your point, this is about as gravy a schedule in the Power 5 conference that you're going to get for an addition. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's when I'm, I've got it pulled up in front of me right now and – Right now, the only the only team that I would say that is playing good ball consistently on this schedule is probably Maryland, who's yep, Maryland. whose only loss was like they acquitted themselves decently against a, a really good Michigan team. I mean, they've they've played good ball. Minnesota's played good ball, but they're coming off kind of with the way that they're blowing everybody out. I had kind of a head scratcher last week where they only put up ten points at home. I mean, it was. It's mm-hmm. certainly interesting to see what the, uh, the 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 opportunity is for this Wisconsin team. But uh, as far as the 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 team itself, is are there any 
are there any shakeups or changes or schematic things that you're you're looking for under an interim head coach for hmm. for first game? You know what I'm really interested in, and I think this is something that um, isn't getting talked about enough is the offense itself isn't going to be dramatically altered, right? Like, but could the sequencing be different? And what I mean by that is Wisconsin under Paul Chris has been very like they have for a long time. And you mentioned this and you were talking about Northwestern running eight times straight up the middle into a box, right? Mm -hmm. That's been Wisconsin all year. And then on third and seven, they go shotgun and throw, you know, where, so what I'm saying is maybe you see some of the sequencing differ. Maybe you come out on first and second down in that shotgun and you try to lose some of the box a little bit because Graham Mertz actually has had moments this year where he's looked pretty good. And quite frankly, Wisconsin's run run blocking hasn't been that strong, but the pass blocking has actually been probably better on the offensive line mm-hmm. this year. So that's that's the biggest thing I'm looking for. Do we see you're not going to see new a bunch of new formations or plays like, you know, they just found out about this change Sunday. The coaches aren't installing a new playbook in three or yeah. four days. But do they go to some of the plays that are already in the playbook that are maybe a little more um, uh, aggressive, maybe a little bit more trend uh, buckling type things where you you try to get Northwestern on on the the back heels a little bit? And I could see mm-hmm. that from Jim Leonard. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have that that transition, it certainly can be uh, interesting to see see how the team responds, how the program responds. But uh, before we get into some key matchups here. Let's uh, give a shout out to our friends at Underdog. This episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to spice up college football season. It's easy to get started and easy to play when you're watching your favorite team. They have uh, these these fun props for both of our teams. Like last last week, I know that there was some lines for for Northwestern on the road uh, at Penn State. All uh, all the offensive guys, and honestly, you should have probably with the weather taking the under and everything i mean ryan Halinski in that weather was never going to throw for over 213 passing yards evan hole i guess when you run into boxes like that he's never going to run for over 69 and a half rushing yards but uh yeah it's just a fun way to kind of keep an added layer to to watching your favorite team play Go to Underdog to make your own picks. Sign up with promo code Locked On, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to hundred dollars. So deposit hundred dollars, get hundred dollars free. Go to Underdog.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or, or Google Play Store. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code Locked On. Get in on the college football pick'em action today. All right, so. I feel like we should get into some matchups here. We uh, maybe we're we're a bit long on on our first segment, but it was fun. I mean, I enjoy good. talking the uh, storylines going into a game like this. But what are what are some key matchups that that have kind of caught your eye about this game? Some things that you're going to be watching right off the bat when when this thing k- kicks off on Saturday. Yeah, one of the things I'm interested in. This is a Northwestern team. Um, you know that is 12th in the Big Ten in scoring offense, 13th in scoring defense. So um, nah, there's issues <laughs> on both spots. But I'm really curious. We talked about Hall a little bit. And the last couple games, he has really struggled in terms mm-hmm. of what what the level of talent that he has in the expectations there. And we've kind of seen a increase with Holinsky throwing the ball, who he's now second in the conference in passing attempts, which to me is incredible. You know, and you talked about him being – a good version of himself, but there's no scenario. I think where <laughs> Fitzgerald wants to have Helinski almost leading the conference and passing attempts. Yeah, that's so fair. I, I I'm really curious about the Northwestern running game going up against the Badgers rush, rush defense that hasn't been as good as it's been in the past and where Northwestern is with the rushing game, how likely they are to stick with it. Or is this offense kind of morphed into Helinski going to throw the ball a lot because we don't trust the running game. I mean, I think that the way you watch this team, uh, my 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 brain was saying earlier that they're one and four. They're they're one and three. We haven't we haven't gotten to week five yet. That's 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 my fault there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, with this team, I think uh, they're gonna try to to make or well, they they are one and four. I'm 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 falling all over myself here. But uh, they're 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 gonna try to run the football. I know that that's that's the bread and butter of this team behind that offensive line. That offensive offensive line has done a good job this year. Uh, they've really done a good job in most spots, giving Halinski time to throw. Um, 
I will say something that was interesting, I guess after three games, three may, I think it was after three or four games, uh, Northwestern's offense was running the most plays in the country. They were mm-hmm. running 89.7 plays per game on offense, which is crazy to think about with 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 Northwestern. They were hitting tempo a bunch uh, in that in that Nebraska game. They ran a ton of plays against Duke. They had to because they were having to come back from down three scores. Um, but I think that Helensky – They've had to throw more than they would like because they have fallen behind so many times. Um, and then I think they've they've had to get so aggressive. If they can establish the run and kind of not fall behind by multiple scores, I think they'll stick with that and you'll see much more limited uh much more limited um pass attempts from 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 Helensky. He's been better, but it's still not what you you want. It's not as effective. After the Southern Illinois game, you've definitely noticed that the the yards, the down the field passing game kind of changed a little bit. It's not. I think they're trying to keep him comfortable because it was it was a, a little bit shocking to see how rattled he got in that game. But um, I think it'll be something to keep an eye on. Can they establish that run? I mean, that's that's the number one matchup for me. How does this? This Northwestern offensive line handle the, the the Wisconsin front. Can they can they open up lanes for Evan Hull and Cam Porter? Cam Porter, who at times has looked pretty explosive in the run game. He almost ran for 100 yards in the opener against Nebraska. At times, it has been uh, when Evan Hull has struggled, has has run the ball probably better. Um, and then I just think getting the getting the ball in Evan Hall's hands and letting him make plays for you because he's the best player on this offense, that's key. And um, I mean, you saw that in the Duke game. He touched the ball 31 times for almost 300 yards, and he uh, he's somebody who I expect to <laughs> them to lean on him in the pass game because he is expect he is so good at that. Um, and then as far as the pass game goes, I, my eye has kind of continued to get drawn to the tight ends. Uh, Marshall Lang and Thomas Gordon, they've kind of consistently started to become involved more and more over time. And they've made some pretty big plays, especially in the middle of, of drives. It's almost like uh, along with Malik Washington, the number one receiver, who's kind of Holinsky's safety blanket, he – looks to Thomas Gordon because Thomas Gordon early in the year made a couple one-handed catches and they were like, Oh dang, this guy, this guy hasn't played a lot because he's been banged up his whole career. And he's out here making plays with basically one shoulder. He's got the big old shoulder brace that locks up one of his arms, but he's out here Love making it. plays. Um, and I think that's, that's a dynamic that I see them using kind of on the other side though. Um, I'm, I'm curious how much of, last week was true improvement from the defense uh, or just a hundred percent weather right. uh, can be chalked up to the weather. Cause the weather was awful last week. Uh, at times the rain looked very, so thick. You could barely see some of the uh, players on the sidelines. Um, and then late in the game, Helensky was trying to pick up some yards with his legs and slid into the sideline. His, his white jersey, the whole back was just brown with mud that had just accumulated on the sidelines. So, I mean, that's the kind of game that they played last week. I still have questions about the team's speed uh, on defense. I think if you go right at them, they can make plays. But mm-hmm. if you make them run sideline to sideline, that's where they've struggled this season. Uh, teams that have been able to get to the edge have had a lot of success. That's my concerns. Um and I don't know if you if you've picked up on that or what what you think the uh, what how, how do you how do you see the the Wisconsin offense attacking North Northwestern in this one? Yeah, it, it Wisconsin. It's so funny, man. When I hear you talk about Northwestern's offense philosophy, we're going to lean on the run, try to limit passing attempts. You know, stop. It's like literally how I would describe Wisconsin. You know, it's like it's a mirror image with. You know, I would love to say we're going to get on the edges. We have a couple of players that can do it. Isaac Rendo is a speedster, um, really fast player that's been battling injuries. And, you know, we, we can throw smoke, sc- smoke screens out to the receivers. We've shown that a little <laughs> bit more this year. But for the most part, it's still been a really unimaginative. We're going to 
bang Braylon Allen, Ches Malusi right up the middle. And we're just going to assume eventually we'll wear you out. And it hasn't worked. Like, But we also haven't seen Wisconsin adapt to it. Now, the big wild card in all this is uh, Paul Christ is gone, right? And yeah. there is a new offensive coordinator in Madison this year. Uh, Bobby Ingram came over from the Baltimore Ravens. But there's never we've never really known for sure how Bobby Ingram is calling the plays, quote unquote. But we've never really known for sure if he's calling plays maybe off of a Paul Chris playbook, right? Where Paul Chris is maybe saying, hey, mm-hmm. we want you to lean run here. And then it kind of limits Ingram with what he wants to do. So it's it's honestly it's a cop out answer but this is a huge just we don't know we don't know because this is bobby ingram's first game yeah without without paul chris there and would i expect the badgers to be get really aggressive and go crazy no but it also wouldn't surprise me if they they kind of said all right let's let's really mix this up a little bit let's come out throw the ball more let's get on the edges so I, I just have no good answer because we have no clue. And we don't even have a, a data set to fall back on with Bobby Ingram because this is his first time ever being a play caller at any level. I got gotcha. you. So we have no concept there. How much of a concern was the rushing performance last week? Because mm-hmm. the, the the run game is something that we've all – I mean, it's synonymous with Wisconsin football and it has been for a very, very, very long time. You can ask any team or any fan in the country uh, – what do you know about Wisconsin is they run the ball and they have all these really good running backs last week. Didn't really show anything. What two yards is, is the, the uh, number that, that, that I saw eight carries for two yards for, for Braylon Allen. What yeah. exactly is that? Is that a total outlier or what, what was the issue there? Uh, do you see that being a problem going forward the rest of the season? So I would say, I mean, two yards is an outlier, right? Like two yards mm-hmm. is oh, an outlier. Yeah. Wisconsin's not going to be that bad most most of the time. But it hasn't been as good this year. And Braylon Allen hasn't been as good this year. And again, a lot of this has led up to the culminating point of Paul Chris being let go. Like even, even the parts that traditionally he's been able to lean on haven't been there. So part of it is offensive line. They're, they've had a lot of injuries. They've had to shuffle a lot of people in and out. There's young players having to step in. They've lost tight ends to injury, which has really hurt the program. Uh, this is a Wisconsin team that has always leaned on those tight ends, but it was also just a performance marred by penalties, by indecisiveness, mm-hmm. by stale play calling. So do I think it'll get better? Yeah, it, it, it'll get better, but we're a far cry from those Wisconsin teams that would just really quite frankly demoralize people in the trenches <laughs> you know no matter how many people are in the box because that's that's what people will say well you can't roll with nine people in the box malarkey wisconsin's been doing that for 15 years like and it hasn't translated to big 10 titles in this like you do have to be more <laughs> dynamic to win at the highest levels but what we saw wasn't illinois is also pretty good by the way i, I do want to give oh, yeah. credits to that's a better program i had a it's funny a really quick segue i had a bunch of illinois fans jump in my comments i was like what's happened to wisconsin They're like hey illinois was good i'm like yeah okay enough <laughs> right because they, they are but rushing for two yards is is more of a sign of wisconsin ineptitude than illinois being better yeah. um i want to take a quick break and then i want to ask you a, a big picture question with northwestern that has really been rattling around in my brain i'm very curious to get your take on this um but first we're gonna take a break to talk about our uh friend sponsoring today's show and we also want to take a second to uh, highlight that after you're done listening to this, go check out Locked On Big Ten. Nate Dickinson brings you all around the conference. He'll let you know everything that's going on with all the rivals we mostly dislike and the ones we really dislike. So make, go check out his show as well on Locked On Big Ten. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the special crossover edition. We got Carter Bird, Northwestern, Ryan Herrings, uh, Badgers here for you every day, your teams every single day. And I I wanted to ask you this because I'm very curious. I want to brought this up, if not for Paul Chris being fired, but Paul Chris being fired was a shock to even a lot of Badger fans who thought the program was slipping. And we are now in the midst of what looks like the third pretty poor Pat Fitzgerald season in the last four years. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of a two-part question. Is there any heat to the seat of Pat Fitzgerald? And if not, like what would what would have to happen for him to be on the hot seat here? You know, I mean, he's so, I guess, ingrained in the fabric of, Nor- of Northwestern football. Um I guess I've had I've had people ask this in the past. I was like, look, I mean, you've got five in like 120 years of football, you've got five 10 win seasons, and he's the coach for three of them, and he was a mm-hmm. player for one of the other two. So I like he's he's an all he was an all American linebacker as a player. He's he's he is Northwestern football, to be honest with you, is is kind of how I'd put it. 
I have a hard time seeing them them move on from him right now. I know it's not a great year. Um, I do think there were there was an aspect of, and you're seeing it kind of it played out last year, and it's playing out um, this year because I think from a strength and conditioning perspective, Northwestern's still behind a bit because I mean for two years there with the school kind of guidelines being, I guess, a private school that was very, I guess, shut down because of the pandemic. Fitz has talked about it. He's like, we weren't able to get in our building to work out. And like, mm-hmm. we weren't able to get in meeting rooms together for, for two years. And he's like, it's starting, it's starting to make an impact. He's like, physically, we look different. We look different in the spring than we did all last season. But I mean, I still think at times, um, there, there, there are some effects of that. And I think that, but there is positivity from the aspect off the field. Mm-hmm. Not only do you have Ryan field house, it's beautiful. looks over the, uh, over the lake. You also have uh, what they're going to do here with Ryan field that they announced last week. They're going to demolish the, the old one after next season. And then, then they're going to build, it's going to be smaller which which honestly is probably a good thing because yeah. uh it'll it'll feel it'll going down 12,000 seats will make it feel bigger because all of the seats will be f- filled I think that'll be a big deal uh and apparently this is the way they're talking about it I think that it's going to they're talking about it setting the standard for future stadiums in college football I think it's and almost the 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 the, the mock ups that I see, it makes it look like uh, some of these really nice uh, soccer stadiums in Europe or or football stadiums, depending on on how you how you talk about the uh, the, the the game over there. But um, I think that that's generated some excitement. I don't know. I just have I have a hard time seeing them this season. Um, making some sort of move. I know it, the season has not gone the way that they would have wanted. You pretty easily could be four and one. Mm-hmm. Um, you've had, you had three losses by, I think it was, I think it was 18 total points. It was, you had a loss by eight, a loss by seven, a loss by three. Um, Starting to sound very Nebraska though. Yeah. Yeah. Right? No, like, no, it, some it, it pretty much is. I mean, and, Nebraska fans would, would would feel the same pain because they lost by what one score to Northwestern and uh, mm-hmm. they've all True. of their all of their their losses feel like they've they've gone that way too. Um, I I just think that maybe if this year goes truly as bad as it looks like it could, I think next year's a year where the conversation would be real. That if there's not a mm-hmm. true bounce back, you you would see a move uh, maybe, but. I just have a hard time. I think he's I think the the expectations right now are different uh from Wisconsin and the teams that have been at the top of the conference for a while and Northwestern on a year to year basis. I mean, yes, Northwestern's won the Big Ten West twice in the last four four seasons before this, but it's a pretty up and down program and has been um and I think that there's at least some acknowledgement of that. I do think it'll be very, very interesting to see what the future holds uh, and see if they can use the the great facilities they're going to have to build any momentum. Um, I would be personally shocked to see them move on from him just because I think he means so much to the Northwestern community. Um, and I think he's, I don't know. I just think I'd be shocked to see him go uh, or to see him let go rather. I'll, I'll say this, and I'm sure it won't happen this year, but when you start stacking incredible lakeside facilities with a eight nine hundred million dollar new stadium, you better start winning some. Like, not yeah. that he hasn't, right? But last year was three and nine. Two years ago, before the COVID season, was three and nine. This year is trending poorly. Yeah, I, there does get to be a point. Like, it's Paul Chris Agreed. is not at let are not at uh, Fitzgerald's level in terms of being intertwined into the the community, but he's pretty darn close. Like he played mm-hmm. at Madison, you know, he coached yeah. here previously. He's won 70% of his games and they were like, eh, nah, we're good. And that's, that's, that's part of why 
what he took the uh, re- reduced buyout because he's lived basically his whole life in Madison, right? Mm, he's, a, he's a Wisconsin guy through and through. Mm. So I, I do want to get to picks on the game. I, I'm very curious to see. So the, I don't know if you've seen the line on this. Um, and Ryan Field, by the way, really quick segue. Badger fans are not going to miss that. That's a house of horrors for Badger fans. Who <laughs> traditionally, when we go down there, it feels like every game is ugly and Northwestern wins at Ryan Field. Mm-hmm. So we're not going to miss that place at all. Um, the line on this game is Wisconsin's favored by 10, which is very, very interesting. I'm curious where you're at on this. Uh, how how would you pick this game based on that? I'm maybe I'm choosing to look at it from an optimist perspective. Um, but I do think the defense that at times has struggled giving up explosive plays, I think that they can build off of last week. Um, and I think that you probably, I would hope at least Ryan Halinsky is going to be more effective than in the rainy conditions than, than he, than he was last week. Last week, it was, it was not a particularly effective performance by him. They did start moving the ball a little bit late when they started actually getting aggressive when they realized, Oh, they have 17 points. This isn't going to be who can kick the most field goals and win a game below 10 points. Um, Started to move the ball a little bit there. I think they probably – you'll see a lot more aggressiveness on offense. Uh, I don't think you're going to see – I'd be surprised if the first eight runs of this one are right up the middle uh, like they were last week. I think this this can truly turn into just like another, another classic like low-scoring, ugly Big Ten game where Wisconsin's trying to, to – feel things out under an interim coach um, trying to get back to a little bit of who they've always been. And I think that, and maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe they just get super aggressive and go borderline air raid, but I'd be shocked if that happens. I think it's going to be two teams that are going to try to run the football. Um, And I think it's going to be, if Northwestern can win the turnover battle, I think, because when they've lost, they've, when they lose the the turnover battle, they they have suffered some pretty heartbreaking losses this year. They can win the turnover battle. I think that they can keep it very close. Um, I think that they can keep it within within ten points, but who knows? I I kind of see this being a a twenty four seventeen kind of game in Wisconsin's favor, if I had to guess. But I mean. It feels like every week in the Big Ten, things can, can go haywire. Yeah, for sure. And I think your first point is probably what's going to happen. It's going to be another one of those classic, ugly Big Ten kind of West games that all of Twitter makes fun of. And whoever wins says, no, it's just good old-fashioned football, right? <laughs> like, this is, yeah, get in the mud in the trenches. You know, I, I think it's probably going to be a bit of an ugly game for all the reasons oh, yeah. you listed. I think it's two teams that quite frankly aren't very good right now. Like bad teams contribute to bad games typically, right? That's just kind of how this works. I think both these teams right now are bad. Um I do think yeah. Wisconsin's going to win. I partially just based on my inner fandom to be honest. I <laughs> because I if this doesn't light a fire and if Wisconsin comes out and plays poorly, like then there's nothing there. Then literally there's nothing, there's no fight left. So yeah. Partially just me being a fan of Wisconsin, uh, I'm banking on the fact that the culture has been established for 20 years and there's some fight in that locker room and they're going to come out mad. So that's where I'm at. That's literally what I'm banking on is fight in the locker room. Uh, Fair enough. It's the spot we've reached into the season, but I think Wisconsin wins covering 10 on the road. That's tricky. I would say they don't cover that, but I do think they win 24, 17, 2013, somewhere in that range, kind of like right where you're at. Yeah. I just think that it, Especially in the first half, I think it's going to be one of those games that you that you go to half and it's thirteen to ten or ten to seven and it's mm-hmm. ugly or heck maybe even ten to nine if we're if we're really lucky for some 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 it low could, scoring close. It could football. be an Iowa thing. It's like five to two, right? You know, it could absolutely. <laughs> There's like I watch it because I'm fascinated. I watch Iowa because I'm fascinated with how bad the offense is. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I've I've done a I've done kind of a weekly pick 'em segment around the Big Ten every every week on my show, and every week when I get to the Iowa game, it's just me being like, 
this is painful to watch and they have the worst yeah. quarterback in the country. And it's, and it's, it's miserable. Like when they beat, when they beat South Dakota state seven to three, you're like, Oh man, only one touchdown for, for, for Iowa. That's tough. Nope. No nope. two safeties and a field goal. No, nope. no, nope. they did it the hard way. I love yeah, it. I, it's, it's honestly impressive. I've never seen anything like that game. I watched the entire, I think I watched the last three quarters of that game. <laughs> I had the under in that game. Like, I, I mean, you just can't go wrong banging Iowa unders. Oh yeah, I mean that's that's I mean you can't put a score low enough. If they yep. if they play Rutgers, it'd be that's like the uh, the, the the dream there. <laughs> yes, I agree, I agree. All right, man. Um, I this has been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, it has been. Good luck this weekend. I'm sure we'll talk again. I am Ryan Herring's locked on Badgers. That is Carter Bird locked on Northwestern here for both your teams every single day.